January 1945 was the beginning of the sixth year of the bloodiest and most destructive conflict in human history. In Europe, the heady mood of optimism of winning the war by Christmas, which the British and Americans had believed a distinct possibility in September 1944, had melted away in the face of fierce German resistance. The progress of the armies, commanded by General Dwight D. Eisenhower, Supreme Allied Commander in Europe, had been badly affected by supply difficulties and the onset of a bitter winter. And although the Allies had convinced themselves that a conclusive victory was now within their grasp, the race for Berlin would still take some winning. As the Russian, British and American troops edged ever closer to the German capital, the opening months of 1945 would see some of the most brutal battles of the Second World War as the fight against the Axis powers intensified. This was equally true out in the Pacific too, as the struggle to overcome the Imperial Japanese Army continued. The Allied forces prepared for an attack on mainland Japan, and on a global scale, there was a growing sense of hope that the war would soon be over. But while the Nazi and Japanese troops refused to back down, battling fiercely even when staring defeat in the face, there were still months of fighting ahead, with many more lives destined to be lost before victory could be celebrated. Also, with thoughts turning towards rebuilding Europe in the post-war era, the cracks really began to show between the three major Allied powers, as the democratic principles of America and Great Britain were at direct odds with Russia and the brutal communist regime of Joseph Stalin. The race for Berlin was now not only about defeating Adolf Hitler, but also key to the division of territory in the aftermath of the conflict. But for now, there was still a lot of ground to be covered before the war could be won. As the new year of 1945 dawned, in Europe, all eyes were focused on the Battle of the Bulge that was still raging. Two weeks before, on December the 16th, 1944, a quiet, thinly held sector of the American front line on the Belgian-German frontier had suddenly been torn apart by a massive Nazi offensive. The hills and woods of the Ardennes, the scene of Germany's great blitzkrieg offensive of May 1940, once more reverberated to the crash of artillery and the squeal of panzer tracks as Adolf Hitler's last desperate gamble in the West began. As the Germans pushed into Belgium, Hitler's immediate objective was the River Meuse, but the real strategic prize was the port of Antwerp, which lay another 80 miles away. The loss of this vital supply centre would have spelt catastrophe for Eisenhower's armies, but there was also a more sinister edge to the campaign, as Hitler aimed to encircle the US troops and destroy them. With only three American infantry divisions standing in the way of half a million German troops, supported by nearly 1,000 tanks and assault guns, the surprise attack was a staggering success. Despite US troops fiercely resisting the Nazi onslaught, after seven days of fighting, Operation Watch on the Rhine quite literally punched a bulge in the American front line, which was 50 miles wide and 40 miles deep. This is why the Battle of the Bulge was so named. But as the days passed and Allied reinforcements poured in to defend the area, Hitler soon discovered that despite taking an early advantage, he had underestimated the strength of the enemy. Before long, 
the commanders of the 5th and 6th SS Panzer Armies realised that their troops were simply not strong enough to reach Antwerp or even the Meuse. With fuel running low and Allied bombers pounding their supply routes, the advance of the 6th SS Panzer Army was stalled and by Christmas Day the offensive on the Ardennes had run out of steam. Meanwhile, on the other side of the globe, Hitler's Axis partners, the Japanese, were continuing to struggle against the Allied advance. By the end of 1944, Japan's empire was rapidly shrinking as the pressure mounted. In northern Burma, the British Imperial Army, led by General Bill Slim, supported by American air power, had instigated an offensive to recover the entire country. And further east, powerful American amphibious forces based in the Marianas Islands and New Guinea had invaded Leyte in the thousand mile long Philippines island. It had been an emotional moment for General Douglas MacArthur, who had been stationed as commander of Philippine and American troops when the Japanese invaded in December 1941. In March 42, with defeat looming on the horizon, he'd been ordered by his superiors in Washington to leave his post and take over a new Allied headquarters being set up in Australia. Reluctantly leaving his troops behind to battle on against the Japanese, MacArthur had vowed, I shall return. And on October the 20th, 1944, he had fulfilled his promise, wading ashore with American troops as they returned to the Philippines, invading the island of Leyte. The US Navy also had a few scores of their own to settle, and in the Battle of Leyte Gulf that followed, they managed to wipe out most of the Japanese Navy, including all its remaining aircraft carriers. To the satisfaction of US commanders, the victory saw the attack on Pearl Harbor finally avenged. By November 1944, mainland Japan was also beginning to feel the Americans' wrath at first hand. Airfields in the Mariana Islands, 1400 miles away, giant long range B 29 Super Fortress bombers launched their first raids on Tokyo and other Japanese cities. The next stage in the Pacific campaign was underway and planning now began for a full assault on the Japanese mainland as preparations were made to invade the islands of Iwo Jima and Okinawa. And while the Americans were pleased with their progress in the Pacific, far away in Moscow, Soviet dictator Joseph Stalin was also feeling very satisfied with the way the war was going. the British and the Americans were battling to keep Hitler's panzers at bay in the Ardennes, the Red Army was busy building up its reserves for a massive new offensive in central Poland. The Soviet's main objective was to target the coal mines and steel mills of Upper Silesia, Germany's easternmost industrial region. However, sensing final victory in the air, Stalin had his sights set on Berlin. And the way things were going, the Red Army would get there months ahead of the British and the Americans. On January the 1st, New Year's Day 1945, 
on a dozen battlefields scattered across the globe, it was just another day of death and destruction. In Western Europe, the battle continued in the Ardennes. The Nazi bid for Antwerp in the north had failed miserably, but the 5th Panzer Army that had stormed through the central Ardennes was still battling on for control of Baston. This was one of the few Belgian towns where the road network of the Ardennes converged, and if captured, it would clear the way to the news. Unfortunately for the Nazis, the Americans defending the town belonged to the 101st Airborne Division, who were very possibly the finest soldiers in the entire United States Army. Late December, they'd been joined by three divisions of the US 3rd Army, sent by Lieutenant General George Blood and Guts Patton. Spurred on by their flamboyant army commander, who ordered them to drive like hell, tanks and motorized infantry succeeded in breaking through the 5th Panzer Army's lines. And between Christmas and New Year, Baston had been wrestled from the Germans. However, the Battle of the Bulge was far from being over, because the bloodiest battles of the Winter War in the Ardennes were still to come. Refusing to give up the fight by January 1945, the 5th Panzer Army launched fresh assaults on American forces, now six divisions strong. Hitler also had further plans that he hoped would shatter the Allied defences. Mid-morning on New Year's Day, hundreds of Luftwaffe fighter bombers roared low over Belgium and the southern Netherlands. Luftwaffe chief Hermann Göring's contribution to the ground offensive in the Ardennes, Operation Baseplate, was underway at last. Streaking low over the countryside, the attackers sprayed airfields with gunfire and bombs. And within hours, 465 British and American aircraft had been destroyed or badly damaged. However, the cost to Goering's airmen had been extremely high. 277 German planes had been shot down. While the Allied air forces could easily replace the aircraft they had lost, the Luftwaffe would find it virtually impossible to replace its dead fighter pilots. It was without doubt a busy New Year's Day for the Nazis, because fierce fighting also erupted along the Allied front line between the Saar and Switzerland, as Operation Northwind, Hitler's latest and in point of fact his last offensive in the West, began. Timed to exploit the difficulties faced by Eisenhower in the Ardennes, troops from two German army groups hurled themselves at positions manned by American and French troops on a 70-mile front in Alsace-Lorraine. However, unlike the surprise Ardennes offensive, this time the Allies were prepared and although the Germans succeeded in gaining some ground, they didn't achieve their objective. Having failed to divert Allied troops from the Ardennes to the front further south in Alsace-Lorraine, by January the 6th, the Germans had abandoned all hope of capturing Baston. And this gave Eisenhower the opportunity to assemble his forces on both flanks of the Bulge. In the north, American and British troops were under the command of Field Marshal Sir Bernard Montgomery with the 21st Army Group. 
Richmond in the south, the 3rd US Army was under Patton's command. Ordered by Eisenhower to launch a converging attack on the Germans in the Bulge, their immediate objective was the crossroads town of Hoofalees. Only 20 miles separated Montgomery and Patton's troops, but as temperatures plunged below zero and the bitter winter weather set in, progress was soon reduced to just a mile a day. Frozen roads slowed up tank and motorised units, engine oil froze up, and infantrymen discovered that their rifles and machine guns wouldn't work. There was also the added risk of landmines planted in the snow, which were becoming another serious menace. Whereas Allied infantry were unused to advancing through deep snowdrifts and frozen roads, the Germans had already experienced extreme winter weather fighting in Russia and were much better prepared for the icy conditions. Even so, despite the problems the bitter weather posed for the Allies, even Hitler soon realised that the game in the Ardennes was up. January the 8th, 1945, he gave his frontline commanders permission to abandon the bulge west of Hoofalees and seven badly battered panzer divisions pulled back through the town as Allied artillery pounded their lines of retreat. As the troops under Montgomery and Patton kept up their dogged pursuit of the retreating German forces, by January the 16th, they recaptured Hoofalees by the end of the month, the Allied front line was back exactly where it had been six weeks earlier. Hitler's gamble in the Ardennes had failed, and the watch on the Rhine had resulted in a devastating loss of life on both sides. The Germans had suffered 91,000 casualties, and although the Allies had won the offensive, they had fared little better. Amongst the American forces, casualties were shockingly high, reaching 89,000, with 19,000 of those being fatalities. As the bodies were counted, the Battle of the Bulge emerged as the costliest American campaign of the Second World War. What's more, the engagement not only took its toll in humanitarian terms, because for the Anglo-American High Command, it opened up a number of old grievances that had been festering for some considerable time. Just four days after the Ardennes Offensive had started back in 44, Eisenhower had ordered Montgomery to take temporary command of all British and American forces on the northern side of the bulge. Militarily, the decision made perfect sense, because the German offensive had upset the existing American command structure, but not everyone was happy with the arrangement. US General Omar Bradley, who was renowned for getting on well with everyone, disliked Montgomery intensely, having had difficulties working with him in the past, protested fiercely. And although Montgomery quickly brought stability to the northern side of the bulge, his self-promoting attitude upset and annoyed the Americans. After telling the US generals that their broad front strategy was to blame for the current crises, he went on to infuriate them even further at a press conference on January the 7th by giving the impression that he alone had rescued them from disaster. Livid with rage, Bradley and Patton threatened to resign unless Montgomery was removed from command of the Northern Bulge. To keep the peace, Montgomery eventually apologised for his tactless remarks, which kept his position secure. But the bad feeling continued as the focus switched to the strategic direction of the campaign. 
The British, including Montgomery, with the backing of Churchill and his military advisers, continued to argue in favour of a quick, narrow thrust aimed at the German capital, Berlin. Eisenhower, however, was not prepared to implement such a strategy, being well aware of the vast numbers of men that would be lost in the process, especially as the American troops now outnumbered the British in northwest Europe by more than three to one. Meanwhile, in the Soviet camp, Joseph Stalin had his own agenda. Since August 1944, powerful German forces had kept the Soviets pinned down in central Poland, 500 miles to the east of Berlin. Therefore, instead of pushing on towards the Nazi capital, Stalin had elected to invade the Balkan states in southeast Europe. Brushing aside less powerful German forces, Soviet troops poured into Hungary, Romania and Bulgaria, overrunning the Ploiesht oil fields vital to the Nazi war economy and triggering the collapse of the pro-Nazi regimes in Bucharest and Sofia. By November 1944, Belgrade, the Yugoslav capital, had fallen to the Red Army and local communist partisans. But in the following month, Soviet forces advancing across the Hungarian plains were prevented from taking the capital Budapest, as the Hungarian army, supported by strong German reinforcements, fought back furiously. But all the while, German High Command had been watching the Red Army pour reinforcements behind its front on the River Vistula in central Poland with growing anxiety. Army Group A, the German soldiers responsible for defending this sector, could only muster 400,000 men and little more than a thousand tanks. It was a desperate situation, and by late December, Army Chief of Staff Colonel General Heinz Guderian pleaded with Hitler to halt the Ardennes offensive and send more reinforcements to the Eastern Front. The Nazi Führer ignored the request and was more cut off from the reality of the deteriorating situation than ever. When early in the new year, he was given a report by German military intelligence identifying no less than 225 infantry divisions and 22 armoured corps in the Red Army's order of battle on the Eastern Front, he had exclaimed, who is responsible for producing all this rubbish? Whoever he is, he should be sent to a lunatic asylum. In fact, the Red Army actually outnumbered the 400,000 German troops of Army Group A by 5 to 1. On January the 12th, the long-awaited Soviet offensive began. As a fierce artillery barrage shattered the calm, over the next 72 hours, three Soviet army groups made up of some 3 million troops, 10,000 tanks, 20,000 artillery pieces and 7,000 aircraft burst out of their bridgeheads on the east. objective was the coal field and steel plants of Silesia, the one German industrial area that had largely escaped Allied bombing. But Stalin and his closest military advisers also had a much greater prize in mind. They were determined to get to Berlin before the British and the Americans. Three notorious Soviet commanders had been given the task of leading the Red Army towards the German capital and fulfilling Stalin's hopes and dreams. 
Marshal Koniev, Marshal Rokozovsky, and the Soviet Army's most famous battlefield commander, Marshal Zhukov. Together, they would storm westwards across the war-torn Polish landscape, edging closer to Berlin by the day. By January the 17th, the ruined Polish capital Warsaw had been seized from the Nazis. And as the Red Army continued to advance, soon German civilians from all over the Reich's eastern provinces began to flee. While more territory fell, Nazi guards running labour and concentration camps also began joining the exodus to the west. And with them came hundreds of thousands of Jewish slave labourers. Starving and racked by illness, tragically thousands would die as they marched westwards through the snow. Many of these bedraggled figures came from the notorious camp of Auschwitz, which was soon to be liberated by the Soviets. Only a few thousand prisoners remained when the Russian soldiers arrived on January the 27th, 1945. And as the ruins of gas chambers and crematoria were uncovered, the true extent of the unimaginable atrocities committed by the Nazis was revealed. At least one and a half million had died at Auschwitz, and for those liberating the camp, it was undoubtedly a chilling and disturbing experience to walk within its walls. As the remorseless advance of the Soviets continued, however, Hitler's reign of terror was clearly drawing to a close. As the Red Army continued their march west, to the horror and dismay of the Nazis, the Russians quickly crossed what had been the pre-war German-Polish border. January the 31st, Zhukov's spearhead reached the River Uda at Kustrin, and on February the 13th, Koniev's first Ukrainian front caught up with them and dug in to create a 50-mile wide front along the River Nysa. In just four weeks, the Red Army had advanced 450 miles and Soviet troops were now just 50 miles from Berlin. With practically the whole of Eastern Europe under Soviet control, Stalin was in a confident mood and in a very powerful position. There was no doubt that Germany faced imminent defeat, and while Britain and America still held their ground to the west of Germany, Churchill and Roosevelt were keen to discuss the final phase of the conflict and how to restore order in post-war Europe. At the beginning of February 1945, Stalin persuaded Churchill and Roosevelt to travel to the Soviet Union to meet him at the Black Sea coastal resort of Yalta in the Crimea. The American president was keen to nurture and consolidate relations with the Soviet leader. But beneath his cheerful exterior, as Winston Churchill arrived at the airfield, he harboured a deep mistrust of Stalin's intentions. Nevertheless, there were agreements to be made and setting aside personal opinions. On February the 4th, 1945, the Big Three and their senior military and diplomatic advisers sat down at the Lavidia Palace to an intense round of negotiations that would last a full eight days. Ironically, first and foremost on the agenda was Poland. The nation Hitler had stormed into way back in 1939, forcing Britain and France to declare war on Germany. Churchill was insisting upon free and fair elections for the Poles, 
In fact, both he and the American president agreed that all liberated European and former Axis countries should be given the right to democratic elections. Also of utmost importance to Roosevelt was ensuring Stalin joined the New World Order, the United Nations, and to secure his assistance in the war against Japan. The Soviet leader agreed to participate in the war against Imperial Japan three months after Germany had been defeated, as well as agreeing to join the United Nations. However, he asked a high price in return for his assistance in the Pacific War. For a start, Stalin wanted the recognition of Soviet interests in Mongolia and Manchuria, which were nominally part of China. He also wanted access to Port Arthur in Korea and possession of the Kurile Islands, then occupied by the Japanese. Roosevelt's military chiefs had many reservations about agreeing to such demands. But even so, their president agreed to each and every request. By the time the Yalta conference ended, Stalin had got exactly what he wanted. But only after the war's conclusion would Britain and America realize that a democratic and liberal world was the last thing on the Soviet leader's mind. Under his control, Eastern Europe would be swiftly engulfed into the communist regime. However, entering the final phase of the war and considering the future of Germany, the big three were all of one accord. They would accept nothing short of an unconditional surrender. With the Red Army ready to attack Berlin from the east, Stalin asked that the British and Americans provide practical help for his troops. Heavy Allied bombing raids on railway centres in eastern Germany would interrupt the flow of Nazi reinforcements to the front to face Zukov and Konyev's army groups. As thousands of bombers were available for frontline service in England and Italy, it was a request that the British and Americans could easily accommodate. And as military teams present at Yalta agreed to the Soviet request for assistance, one target loomed large on the maps of the Allied bomber chiefs. It was the German city of Dresden, famous for its many architectural splendors, including a number of magnificent palaces, and was much admired as the Baroque jewel on the River Elbe. But as well as being renowned for its beauty, Dresden was also a centre for industry, producing many commodities for the German war effort, the benefit of an important regional railway centre. So far, it had escaped heavy Allied bombing because of its distance from RAF bases. But soon after the Yalta conference, all this would change. Over the course of the 13th and 14th of February, 700 RAF heavy bombers took off and were soon swarming above the city. Before long, thousands of incendiaries and high explosive bombs were being released onto Dresden's elegant streets and avenues and a terrifying firestorm took hold. By the time the bombardment ended, the city was reduced to rubble and ruins, and thousands of people had lost their lives. According to official figures, anything from 21,000 to 35,000 people had been killed. But the railway, which the raid had aimed to cripple, was left undamaged. However, the destruction of Dresden did little to affect the outcome of the war and the huge death toll presented Nazi propaganda chief Joseph Goebbels with a unique opportunity to embarrass RAF Bomber Command and its Chief Air Marshal, Sir Arthur Harris. As the news of the loss of the city's magnificent palaces and cathedral, along with rumours of 200,000 dead, 
all cleverly exaggerated by Goebbels, was circulated in neutral Swedish and Swiss newspapers, the British Foreign Office became suitably alarmed. But the devastation caused by Allied bombing raids was not confined to Europe, because far away in the Pacific, US Major General Curtis LeMay was coordinating attacks on Imperial Japan that would prove just as horrifying as the attack on Dresden. Giant Boeing B-29 Superfortresses had been raiding Tokyo and other Japanese cities from bases in the Marianas Islands since November 1944. But when the attacks didn't prove as effective as LeMay had hoped, by January 45, he'd decided to make drastic changes to his strategy. The majority of Japan's town and city dwellers lived in houses made of wood and paper, so LeMay realised that incendiaries would cause the greatest possible devastation. He therefore decided that low-altitude night attacks would prove far more effective than high-altitude daylight raids. On the 24th of February, 11 days after the annihilation of Dresden, the Americans launched their first night raid on Tokyo with 170 B-29s carrying only incendiaries in their bomb bays. The resulting fires destroyed one square mile of the city and this raid was just the beginning. Two weeks later, on the night of March the 9th, LeMay organised a much bigger attack on the Japanese capital, dispatching 325 B-29s. Crammed into their bays were bombs filled with highly flammable magnesium, phosphorus and napalm, while their defensive guns were removed to increase the range and payload. As the aircraft took off, the weather conditions were perfect for the attack. The air was dry and strong winds were blowing, which would ensure the fires spread swiftly around the city. Flying in streams ranging from 5 to 9,000 feet above the target to confuse artillery fire, American bombers were soon looming above the city. The sky quickly lit up as nearly 1,700 tons of incendiaries were dropped in three hours. As fierce winds whipped up the flames, the fire began to rapidly scythe its way through the streets lined with wooden huts. As tens of thousands of people tried to escape, their routes were blocked by vast walls of fire and they had little hope of survival. 16 square miles of the city were consumed by flames and by daybreak the bodies reduced to ashes was simply scattering like sand. More than 100,000 souls had perished in the flames. It was the deadliest air raid in the whole of the Second World War and had cost US Bomber Command only 14 B-29s. Between March 1945 and August the 15th, when the Japanese finally surrendered, Curtis LeMay's bomber crews would wreck 64 Japanese cities, cripple the nation's war industries and reduce 2.5 million buildings to rubble. The Japanese put the civilian death toll at more than 1 million people. Seven decades later, the controversy generated by the fire raids on Dresden and Tokyo still haunts the world. Nevertheless, at the time, advocates of area bombing like Air Marshal Bomber Harris and Major General LeMay justified the tactic on the grounds that it helped to win the war. Even so, by 1945, Japan still showed no sign of surrendering, and although the Allies had been steadily winning back territory from the grip of the Empire of the Rising Sun, there were still many bitter battles ahead. <laughs> 
While American troops continued the fight to reclaim land they'd lost to Imperial Japan at the outbreak of the Pacific War, by January 1945, General Douglas MacArthur was preparing for the next step in the recapture of the Philippines. With Leyte and Mindoro secure, the next step in the campaign to avenge the American defeat of 1942 was the invasion of Luzon, the largest island in the Philippines chain. On January the 9th, 1945, 175,000 American troops belonging to Lieutenant General Walter Kruger's 6th Army landed on the south shore of Lingayen Gulf on Luzon. Defending the territory on the ground, Japan's General Yamashita was well aware that American forces had the upper hand in firepower and mobility. As a result, he ordered his 170,000 Japanese soldiers to retreat deep into the jungle from where he hoped they would have a better opportunity to overcome the opposition. But while the struggle continued throughout January, by the end of the month, Kruger's army was closing in on the Philippines' capital, Manila. The Japanese realized that their grip on the island was slipping. Meanwhile, secondary landings by more US amphibious forces and paratroopers had come to support Kruger's army. And by February the 3rd, the first American troops had reached Manila. Three years earlier, defeated American soldiers had walked through Manila's streets with their general, Jonathan Wainwright, subdued and bedraggled as the Japanese looked on in triumph. Those that had survived the ordeals of the last few years were still being held prisoner along with many civilians and it was Kruger's first objective to liberate the thousands of people who were still suffering in the Japanese prison camps. As the 1st and 8th US Cavalry Divisions and Filipino guerrillas advanced into the northern outskirts of the city, 6,000 civilian Filipino, American and British Commonwealth citizens were discovered interned at the University of Santo Tomas, as well as 1,000 American prisoners of war at Bilibid Prison. Meanwhile, two commando raids organized by American Special Forces liberated hundreds of starving, disease-ridden captives in camps at Cabernatone and Los Banos. While fighting erupted all over the city, the prisoners were soon set free and evacuated to safety as every effort was made to regain control of Manila. Ironically, just like MacArthur back in December 1941, Yamashita had wanted to spare the beautiful capital of the Philippines from destruction and had ordered his troops out of the city. However, 16,000 Japanese naval troops and nearly 4,000 soldiers led by Rear Admiral Iwabuchi disobeyed his orders and reoccupied the city as fighting quickly escalated into what has been recorded in the history books as the worst urban battle of the Pacific Theatre of War. Manila's civilian population found themselves caught up in the deadly crossfire. And many people were killed, with thousands shot or bayoneted as Iwabuchi's men ran amok. Filipino women and girls were hunted down, raped and murdered by the score. And as the Americans continued to bombard the city with aerial raids and tank attacks, even more lives were lost. The fighting didn't end until March the 3rd. The Japanese garrison had been entirely wiped out, by which time civilian deaths had risen to staggering proportions. But for the Americans and Filipinos alike, victory had come at a high price. There were 6,000 US casualties, with more than 1,000 fatalities. And while the city lay in ruins, the civilian death toll rose to an estimated 100,000. These were terrible times for the people of Manila. And while the Americans attempted to restore order as civilians tried to piece their shattered lives back together, the Allied plans to invade Japan continued at an even more determined pace. <laughs> 
In fact, as the battle for Manila had been raging, a huge American amphibious invasion force made up of the aircraft carriers, battleships, cruisers and destroyers of the 5th US fleet was steaming towards the island of Iwo Jima, 800 miles south of mainland Japan. Normally uninhabited, Iwo Jima was barely four miles long and a little over two miles at its widest point. Dominating its southern end was Mount Suribachi, an extinct volcano 546 feet high. The plan was to convert this pile of rock and volcanic ash into one big airstrip for General Curtis LeMay's B-29 Super Fortresses and P-51 Mustang fighter escorts. This would bring LeMay's bombers one step closer to Tokyo and assist in terrorizing Japan's cities. The attack on Iwo Jima started with 10 weeks of heavy bombing and three days naval bombardment to break down Japanese defences. Then, at 2am on February the 19th, 1945, Operation Detachment, the invasion of Iwo Jima, began. As a storm of high explosives and steel lashed the island, 70,000 US Marines braced themselves for an assault landing just before 9am, the first waves of US Marines hit the beach. Much to their surprise, they found no sign of the enemy, and for a brief moment thought that the weeks of bombing and shelling had destroyed the Japanese defences. However, the reality of the situation was quite the opposite. The massive American bombardment had left Iwo Jima's 23,000 strong garrison virtually unharmed, hidden away in an extensive complex of tunnels, bunkers, weapons pits and gun emplacements. Suddenly the air was filled with the thunder of the heaviest mortar and artillery fire that many of the American troops had ever seen, much of it from gun emplacements on Mount Suribachi. The scene was described by one reporter as a nightmare from hell. Nevertheless, despite the growing number of casualties, the American forces slowly edged closer towards the base of Mount Suribachi. This resulted in the containment of the Japanese troops defending the mountain. And on the fifth day of the invasion, February the 23rd, 1945, a Marine patrol managed to reach the summit and unfurl the Stars and Stripes. A short time later, five U.S. Marines and a U.S. Navy medic raised a second and much larger American flag over Mount Suribachi, and the dramatic photograph taken of the event was soon circulating around the world. It came to symbolize the raw courage of the U.S. Marine Corps, but the battle for Iwo Jima was far from over. Three of the men in Joe Rosenthal's stirring photograph were killed shortly afterwards as the 4th and 5th Marine Divisions, reinforced by the 3rd US Marine Division, proceeded to clear the rest of the island. The Marines suffered extremely heavy casualties as they fought for Iwo Jima, quite literally, yard by yard. Over the course of a month's bitter fighting, the Japanese on Iwo Jima were gradually dragged from their underground hideouts, but it cost the lives of many Americans. On the 16th of March, Iwo Jima was declared officially secure, but another five days passed before the Japanese command post on the northwest side of the island was located and destroyed. Finally, on March the 26th, 1945, after 35 days of the bitterest fighting, the battle was over. Of the island's 23,000 strong Japanese garrison, barely 1,000 had survived as prisoners of war. Although the Allies now had a base one step closer to Japan, from where Curtis LeMay could launch his terror bombing, the fighting on Iwo Jima was a grim foretaste of the ordeal that lay in store for the sailors, soldiers and marines assigned to the Americans' next big operation in the Pacific. In the battle against Japan, 
this was to be the invasion of Okinawa, and while the Marines prepared themselves for yet another battle, back in northwest Europe, the Allied armies commanded by General Dwight D. Eisenhower were ready for the end game. Their aim was to eliminate all German forces west of the River Rhine, and in so doing, set the stage for the final drive into the heart of Nazi Germany. Roads, railways, bridges and canals all over Western Germany were successfully targeted and civilian casualties were heavy. Finally, Operation Grenade got underway as the 9th US Army began its assault across the River Ruhr, while General Omar Bradley's 12th US Army Group launched its own race for the River Rhine in Operation Lumberjack. On March the 7th, soldiers belonging to the 9th US Armoured Division seized the Ludendorff Bridge at Remagen before its astounded German defenders had time to set the demolition charges properly. With lightning speed, General Bradley ordered the 1st US Army to rush as many troops as possible across the bridge. General Patton was also active, and by March the 21st, under his command, the 3rd US Army had surrounded the German divisions in his sector. 24 hours later, Patton's men had crossed the Rhine between Mainz and Mannheim, and their bridgehead was secure. In six weeks, the Germans had lost 290,000 troops west of the Rhine. The Allies across the last natural major obstacle in the West, there was little the Nazis could do to prevent the British and Americans advancing all the way to Berlin. As the British Prime Minister arrived on March the 24th, he crossed the Rhine and set foot on its eastern bank in a truly symbolic moment. Churchill was now eager to press on towards Berlin, but with so many Allied servicemen already lost in bitter battles, on March the 28th, 1945, Eisenhower took decisive action to begin the final stage of the campaign for Northwest Europe. Much to Churchill's dismay, Eisenhower, who was intent on keeping Allied casualties to a minimum, declared that Berlin was no longer a major military objective task of securing Hitler's last stronghold to the Russians. Scarcely believing the news to the east, Stalin ordered Marshal Zhukov and Marshal Konyev to the Kremlin to plan the Red Army's final offensive against Nazi Germany. Soon the Soviets would begin their advance. In just two months, the European war would be over. But for now, the final countdown for Berlin had only just begun. The most important battle of all was about to be played out. <laughs> <laughs>